session with Dr. Sergei Kapsov, one of the leading scholars in the Center for Jewish Art. Dr. Kapsov has published more than 60 essays on history of urban planning and synagogue architecture. He has authored and co-authored five books and co-produced 16 multimedia um, CDs on synagogues. His outstanding uh, commitment and contribution to the study of Jewish architectural heritage in Eastern Europe and Israel is truly remarkable. Professor Kovtsov will speak today on the artist distinctly in Jewish collective memory from traditional society to avant garde. Thank you. I know what I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awards a significant place to the builders of synagogues as it does to the painters of synagogue murals and the covers of, the, of Torah arts. These narratives played an important role in the Jewish community's perception of and its self identification in the townscape. Tales about masters, both Jewish and Christian, full of oddities, deductives, and miracles deliberately circulated in Jewish traditional society, although they were not recorded until the early 20th century. Sometimes the tale echoes an inscription left by a master of his work, but most often it is an independent form of collective memory. The legends live according to the rules of their genre, often making use of universal subjects, so that their understanding is difficult without the context of non-Jewish folklore. The Israeli School of Folklore Studies is deeply involved in the study of the international tale types and their adaptation to Jewish religious texts and daily life. For the Jewish addresses and the Jews in their historical mutations and geographical variety. Such adaptation leads to the production of new narratives called oikotypes in accordance with the theory and terminology, terminology transferred by Karl from Ziegler, from biology to ethnography. The present paper is dedicated to the adaptation of the tale of a giant as a master builder, Anna Thompson, 1099, which is popular in Jewish folklore and Berlin. The paper deals with the main components of this tale as rendered in a traditional society, its transformations in the writings of European cultured interpreters Jewish national romanticists, and those who abandoned this latter term to embrace the artistic avant-garde. Interestingly, the very possibility of tracing these transformations exists owing to Jewish national romanticism and its desire to record legends in the hope of producing a new national art based on, based on a folk tradition. The First known to me Jewish version of the tale of a giant as a master builder was published in 1907 in Lviv by Charles Renaud under the pseudonym Echad Nair, one of the townsmen. The young author retold legends of his native Bucic in Galicia about an old synagogue that once stood in the Shulgas of which only a shabby wall remained. He continues. The new great synagogue of today stands far away from that shoulders. It is built like that old one, and they say that it was built by the same builder. The builder also constructed a town hall. He built it of marble and adorned it with marvelous sculptures. Like in all the legends circulated in other communities, you will be told in our town that when the builder accomplished all his works, Count Potrotsky, called him to the tower and threw him down onto the ground to prevent him from building such an edifice in another place. Agnon's text includes many characteristic components of type 1099. 
This most, in its most popular versions, a giant globe or devil is commissioned to build a cathedral and has to finish his work by a fixed deadline. He demands an impossible, sometimes horrible remuneration, like the sun and moon or the eyes of his client. Just guessing his name can lead to cancellation of the deal. His name is discovered and the giant loses not only his remuneration but his very life. This subject, present in Snorra Edda, became very popular in the 17th and 18th centuries, especially in Swedish, Norwegian and German folklore. It is known in its Edda version, in Scandinavian, Baltic, with Western and Eastern European variations. In the Bucic legend, neither the builder's name nor his remuneration is mentioned. He erected three buildings, each at a different time, and his work on two synagogues in his move to the periphery of the globe. Though that is what adapts the legend to the Jewish audience, the main interest of the Chivas town is in the perfection of the town hall, and it is this that causes the builder's downfall, similar to that of the builder in many tales of this type. Nevertheless, it is important to the Jewish narrator that the synagogues in Buchec were built before the town hall. In other words, that the Jews are well rooted in the town. It is worth noting that Agnon would return to the subject in his city in its fullness, likening the hero to Icarus and naming him Theodor after the name of a local hero. Another version of this tale about the Valinian town of Olika was recorded by Avram Rechtman, a participant of Ansky's expedition of 1913. In Rechtman's report, a sick count, the owner of the town for whose help the local Greek Catholic priest and the rabbi pray, promises them respectively to build a church and a synagogue. When the rabbi's prayer, rabbi's prayer is successful, the recovered kind, count decides to build both a church and a synagogue. He commissions two buildings from the architect to be built simultaneously, brick by brick. Thus, the church and the synagogue are identical in appearance. The buildings are so sublime that the count sentences the architect to death to prevent him from constructing anything as wonderful for another count. This legend is a variation of the Western European version of the master building tale. Its motive of bricks placed one by one in two different buildings closely recalls the tale about two giants constructing a church. They have only one hammer and keep throwing it back and forth every day. It also resembles those tales like the one about the towers of St. Stephen's <coughs> Cathedral in Vienna where two competing builders have to finish their work simultaneously rather than being given a deadline. The simultaneous work of the synagogue and the church distinguishes the Alika legend from the Buchach one, where both synagogues were built before the town hall. This trait of the Alika legend speaks not only of the competition between the Jewish and Ukrainian communities, but also of the Jewish narrator's view of them as equally rooted in the town and possessing equally beautiful sacred edifices. The rabbi's su supremacy over the priest as a healer and miracle maker is the key to this equality. Beside the legends about the nameless builders, there are stories about the tragic destiny of actual Jewish masters. For instance, Leib Benjamin from Lask, who lived in the late 18th century, builder of the synagogue in Lutomers, later worked on a synagogue in Zlochev where he fell from the scaffolding and died. Another Jewish builder and decor decorator of that period, David Friedlander, reportedly suffered a similar fate. Taking into consideration the folkloric nature of this information, as retold by Matthias Berson, we may suggest that in keeping with the rules of the Shah, a typical tale motive prevailed over the so-called historical truth. In these stories and determine the unhappy, their unhappy endings. It should be mentioned that there are also stories about Polish masters, the architect Lodzinius Butsevich and fresco painters Antoni Zabrowski and Antoni Dodzinievski who fell from scaffoldings and died. However, their deaths have never been referred to as legends. 
Some Jewish stories about synagogue painters are similar to the tales about builders. Such a story was told about a Jewish painter who decorated the great synagogue in Zdai with the signs of the Zodiac and the tribes of Israel. In one, of the, in one corner of the synagogue, he depicted a man pulling out a fish. It's not, it's not the place, but it's the model. According to the legend, this was a depiction of the artist himself. After he finished painting, he became confused, detached himself from the rope on which he was suspended, fell, fell and died. His death was seen by the townsmen as a punishment for his transgression of the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, by portraying himself in the synagogue. Thus, the addition of an explicitly Jewish motive adapts this legend to the Jewish narrator and his god fearing audience. The cause of the artist's punishment is his own sin and not the jealousy of the crime, as it was in the Buddhist and political legends, which are closer to the European patterns. It should be mentioned that in this very legend, as in Buchich and Olika, the master is nameless, though guessing the builder's name is the motive of the master builder legend tale in many non-Jewish versions. In this very legend, the master is ours, unlike a giant or a troll who are distinctively others in the European tales. The Jewish artist trans trans trespasses the boundary between the ours and others, loses his mind and dies. The story is about covers of Torah art who are definitely always iron some trades close to the tales about master builders and painters. A number of attitudes to the artist's name may be distinguished in these stories. These attitudes point not only to the mechanism that separates the significant from the non-significant in the collective memory, but also the religious, specifically Jewish, components of their clothes. In several cases, the source of the memory of the master's name is an inscription on the art. Probably the most instructive inscription expressing the artist's intentions is found on the art in Druya, Belarus. Master who made this holy work to be a son of Israel cast from the holy community of Tamar. We can discern here the artist's efforts. His work is holy, since its product, which adorns the liturgy, is a holy object, a repository of the Torah scroll, and it is done in a spirit of religious devotion. The artist has no reason to shy away from declaring his name. On the contrary, the inscription may well bring him respect and new permissions. Maybe the artist hopes for the redemption as an reward. I'm thankful to Ilya Rota for this idea. The artist's efforts is rational within a religious tradition. He doesn't transgress the norms of the traditional Jewish society. Another attitude towards the cover's memory is, ex it is exemplified in a tale about the famous master Oyser, son of Ikhel from Kremenitz, who produced the mouth in Radzivilov, Bolivia, in the 1880s. Rickman reports that the master worked a whole year and made a magnificent tour up with Dove, lions, leopards, gazelles, turkeys, eagles, doves, and so forth. In the end, he put his name at the base of the art. Ozer, the son of Ikel, the work of my hand, wherein I glow. Isaiah 16.21. Five months later, on the first day of Shavuot, a sudden thunderbolt broke the synagogue's door and erased the master's name from the Torah art. This incident caused great astonishment, but it soon became known that the master had earlier produced several altarpieces in Catholic churches, and therefore signing his name on the art was considered a desecration. A Jewish narrator condemns the master for transgression of the second commandment, commandment for making graven images for other gods. However, the penalty is imposed neither on the master nor on his work, which serves the holy community of Radzivilov. Only his name suffers the blow. The Zivilo Jews were reluctant to mention another master's name, that of the Lvov painter who decorated their synagogue in 1906. By 1912-13 it was totally forgotten. Moreover, inscribing the names of those synagogue elders who had organized 
that reconstruction of the real rear wall of the prayer hall, Western Wall, was condemned by part of the community as inappropriate to the holiness of the place. Supposedly, the Radzivilu legend about Master Oyser's signature is not only deductive, but also theological. It rather than a sudden thunderbolt explains the lack of the signature of the famous master who is believed to be the author of the magnificent art. Another example of memory and oblivion is found in the community of Baustein, Zengel. According to the note by Latvian historian, art historian Viswaldas Pangirot, the Torah art in the great synagogue of the town donated in 1849 was the work of a seven old kite shapsha. The local Jews only recalled his first name and he had no sign on the arm. What they did recall was that the work took him three years and then he died. The story was that the same master had produced a similar arm elsewhere in Poland, but it had been destroyed by fire. Unlike Shapsha's family name, the name of the surname of the painter who decorated the synagogue Yosel Erlich was preserved in the community's memory. The memory of Master Shapsha was burned by his own humbleness and by the community's natural tendency to forget. His artistic career was terminated by his death, almost like those of the legendary builders, and his work is ephemeral beside his efforts and the beauty of his final project. Other stories testify to the complete oblivion of the master's name. People in the stage of Bolivia recall that the art in their synagogue had been made by a master from Kremlis, who was stationed for several years in the house of Ruben Popik and worked at the premises of the United Charity for two rubles a week. Thus, the name of the local Jew, the grandfather of the narrator who hosted the master, the charity society that gave a working space to the master and the humble remuneration were all better remembered than the master's name. Probably the artist himself did not attach importance to his name since he didn't leave it on the art. A similar story was recorded by Hatskilis Lerkinis in Patrois, Lithuania, where the master of the art was remembered as a semi-literate who worked slowly for a little money and food. Thus, the stories about masters of Torah arts resemble the legends of master builders and artists insofar as the object of their work is very special and cool. Its holiness depends on the community's and master's faith and his observance of religious norms. The Torah art is more holy than the synagogue building, the after Megillah 4, and the master's observance is significant to the community. The master understands the complexity of his position, the production of graven images bears in it the danger of transgression, and hence he is God fearing and humble, happy for even a modest remuneration. What matters to him is the sacred destination of his work and its perfection, and he never hurries. He seldom leaves his name on his work, since his signature on a holy object may be considered improper. An additional motive which might be related to the master builder tale appears in the story of Shapsha. He dies on completion of his last art, thus crowning it as his opus magna. By and large, these stories provide authentic information on collective memory and oblivion. This process is inevitable concerning the gap of years, even decades, between the production of the art and its narration. The master's name is not of much importance either to himself or to the community, and it is not confirmed by his signature. The Jewish tale, tale of a master builder and well underwent significant transformations in the 1910s and 20s. The first case we will discuss is Anski's version of the aforementioned Olika legend. First heard during the expedition of 1913 and edited sometime before Anski's death in 1920, it was, it was published in 1925. Unlike in Rechtman's report, in this version the Count of Olika decides to build three edifices. A Catholic church promised to the priest, a synagogue promised to the rabbi, and a town hall to satisfy his own will. He, hired a famous foreign architect, 
instructing him to erect the three buildings at exactly the same time. The architect drove three posts into the ground to indicate where the church, the synagogue, and the town hall were to be built. Then he stretched the rope from post to post and, balancing himself from it, went backwards and forward, laying brick after brick in sequence. As the buildings rose, he tied the rope high and high, and that was how he was able to build these three structures simultaneously. The Jewish count, seeing three identical gorgeous edifices, refused to allow the architect to leave Olika to build such beautiful building elsewhere. He cut the poles, the architect fell from the rock and died. The, artifici the artificiality of this plot is remarkable. It is embellished with acrobatic stunts and psychological reflections unknown in the previous versions of the tale. Unlike in the Buchach legend, where the central scene is the town hall and the two synagogues occupy subsidiary places, Anski's plot evolves simultaneously around the church, synagogue, and town hall. It also differs from the Olika legend in Redman's reduction, where the scene is hypertide in accordance with the binary opposition between the hours and others, Jews and Christians. I would argue that Anski's text is not an accurate documentation of the tale as told to him, a learned visitor in a provincial town, but rather his adaptation of the text to make it appeal to a modern educated Jewish audience. The plot is closely related to the contemporary dramaturgy, and particularly to Henry Ibsen's play The Master Builder, written in 1892. This play was translated into Russian and successfully staged by Akim Volinsky in 1905 in the theater of Vera Komisarzewskaya. The theater owner played the role of Hilda and the young Kornechukovsky published the review. The play was also translated into Yiddish, published in New York, and judging from the note on a preset copy of the play was staged in those lands where Polish served as a lingua franca. Ibsen's plot is tripartite. The master builder consequently built three edifices which are meaningful in his life. A new house instead of the burnt one, a church tower, and the new house for his new love. He climbs the scaffolding of the new house to put a traditional wreath on the steeple, but trapped by his fear of heights, he falls and dies. It, it is well known that Scandinavian folklore inspired many of Ibsen's works and the impact of the pale giant as a master builder on his master builder is obvious. Probably, Hansky was influenced by Ibsen, and an international type tale only brought the growth of the Jewish and Norwegian authors closer to one another. The Jewish Leolita tale in Hansky's edition, like in Redman's, is conveyed by the supremacy of the rabbi killer over the priest. Hansky's Ansky considered the dominance of the power of words and spirit to be an ingenious feature of Jewish folklore and the Olika legend illustrated his theory. The tale of a master builder in another variation relating the death of a Jewish artist underwent an even more revolutionary transformation in the text by a Jewish artist and theorist named Elisitsky. The young Lisinski made a survey of Jewish traditional folk art which, according to the national romanticists, was to generate a new national Jewish art. As part of his project, Lisinski and his colleague Issachar Berliba were sent by the Jewish Historical Ethnographical Society to an expedition. They visited, among other places, Dolginova, Kopis, and Moiler. In Moiler, they copied the 18th century synagogue murals by Chaim Yitzhak Sadatosilski. was also interested in the folk stories about the master. Sketches of the murals were published in 1923 in Milgroen, a Berlin magazine, together with Lisitsky's reminiscences of the synagogue, the report on the memories related to the artist who painted it, and his own contemplations on the artist's role in society. However, a revolution occurred in Lisitsky, Lisitsky's artistic life in the years between his becoming acquainted with the tales 
from the provincial towns in 1916 and his retelling of those tales in the Berlin magazine of 1923. In 1970 Lisitsky was inseparable from the National Romanticist project. He participated in the creation of a new Jewish art, also working on the Kiev Kultur Liga and for the Jewish publisher Shamir. He produced remarkable works of Jewish books, book art, Sikhes Hulim, Vatgadia, Ingles, Ingles, During that period, Lisitsky treated Jewish ethical, religious, and eschatological subjects as existential, as significant to the artist and reader, and he developed modernized artistic means to achieve his goals. The following years, 1920, were witnessed a break in Lisitsky's mindset, a revolution which corresponded to the prophetic period in the life of his elder colleague, Kazimir, Kazimir Malevich, and which was reflected in programmatic text and art. In his article, article The Suprematist of World Building of 1920, Lisitsky proclaimed the New Testament replaced the Old to be replaced by the New Communist Testament, which the Suprematist Testament now replaces. After with this ideology, Lisitsky broke with his national romanticism and expressionist stylistics of 1917, 1719th, and following Malevich became a suprematist and then a constructivist. Thus Lisitsky returned to his Mogilov impressions after a seven year break, viewing them from the new artistic and anti-religious position. He tells his Berlin audience. They say he, Heinz Hatzegar, painted three synagogues, Moira, Popus and Dovino, others named other places. When he completed his work, he fell from the scaffold and died. Each town tells the same tale, but with a significant difference. The Mohegrover Jews say he died in Mohegrover. The, co the Kapusas in Kapus, and the Vinovers in Delta. The story illustrates the esteem in which the artist was held. So great was his work that his later life could only diminish him. Having completed the work, his soul had no more need to return to remain in his, in his body. In this passage, like in most of his reminiscences of the new <coughs> he simply expresses his own avant-garde attitude to the master, his work, his sense of the man's life and death. This attitude dramatically differs from everything we come across in traditional Jewish tales, where the master has to maintain a balance between a work of piety and sin, where punishment suddenly follows an artistic act, and where the artist's name is seldom remembered. Lisitsky's master has accomplished his earthly mission. He may die, but his name is remembered for generations. This motive links the story of the master not so much where the master built the trail as with the biography of Kazimir Malevich who stopped painting, moving to the sphere of pure prophetic speculation after his discovery of suprematism which he considered the ultimate form of, the art, of a new art. To conclude, the Jewish tales about painters are similar to those about buildings. Both are adaptations of the giant as a master building tale. Some traits of the tales about carvers of the Torah are also similar to this type. The adaptation of these tales to the Jewish addresses and addresses is based on the motive of the second commandment, on questioning the appropriateness of signing the master's name on a separate object, and the equal anchoring of synagogue and the church in the same townscape. This equality, equality is based on the rabbi supremacy of the Christian priest. The same uh, as the scenes of historical epoch, at the scenes, at the scenes of historical epochs, Jewish archetypes are revised and modernized. This process takes two routes, dependent on the addresser and his addresses. Anski's text is styled as a traditional one, but its structure, tripartite instead of bipartite, echoes a modern drama, occasionally related to the same universal tale type. In Lisitsky's case, 
the artist's religious status is replaced with a secular, avant-garde one. Lysitsky is <coughs> projecting his own suprematist understanding of the artist's destiny onto Jewish collective memory and folklore. Thank you. Push back the um, scholarship about uh, builders of the synagogue further back. Most scholars, because of the prohibition of, of Jews in building trades, have uh, been unknown, and you know we don't know. And other people have suggested uh, Christian builders uh, for earlier synagogues. I mean, is there a transition date to, to the time we have a few Jewish builders, or do you want to push that back and say we've got Jewish builders way beyond what? Others have suggested, or no, I'm, not, I'm not going so far. I just would like to say that we have to, to consider also the standard literary or folkloric motives that could stand behind these stories. Actually, uh, when Berson told these two stories of Jewish architects, these are only only two stories that he told. This is, as they say, as they say, he never says it. Uh, Sergey, I wonder um, when, when you told the story of uh, Olika and the ropes being cut. You said, "What a client!" You know, you. But but the whether in the original telling or maybe in Ansky's uh, retelling, it was also being cast in some way as a cautionary tale about working with. Uh, with Gentile patrons thinking, somebody mentioned the transito, thinking about Samuel Halevi or thinking about Joseph Oppenheimer, all of these people who became close to their clients and then essentially had the rope cut. Um, is there any sense of how this fits in with a broader, uh, a broader thinking about uh, mor moralizing about uh, behaviors? Or? I think it's very interesting what you say should be considered also. You know, the, the broader context is the, the better conclusions to be drawn. Great stories. Okay. Just to add and maybe comment, I'm not sure how it's related, but just to continue Sam's idea. In the Middle Ages, we have legends, especially in Germany, of Jews killing icons of the Madonna. Yeah. And then the people with that, you know, kind of, and I don't know how much, but they entered into the church, and so they have to be punished for that. Well, it's again a legend, so... Uh, yes, but there are many legends also important because Jews desecrating what's the... Yeah, exactly. 
No, but this is the image. I mean, there's a lot of image of the Madonna and that's the painting. But it's not, I don't know, I'm not sure it fits this, this type of uh, yeah. Arnold Thompson. <laughs> it's, it's another, it's another, another type. Yeah. 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 It's, it's shocking to hear of uh, church and synagogue simultaneously being built. Um, for example, Gavorsjitz, um was uh, the church and the Bern Bernadine Monastery, uh, the synagogue and the Bernadine Monastery were built simultaneously by donations from the, uh, the magnate's wife, actually, uh, to both of them simultaneously, so they arise simultaneously. I, but this is something very different. Yeah, but also in the of the legend of both towers of Saint Mary built and one of the yeah. of the builders falls from the scaffold. So it's, it's very popular in popular. Sometimes they give names, sometimes they, in, in Vienna they have the names and relationship between the apprentice and the master builder. All these all these legends are uh, ideological. They explain why why one tower is lower than another. <laughs> <laughs> Another, uh, when, when you mentioned the three, the three posts being put in and the three buildings erected simultaneously, it reminded me um, of 25 years ago when I went to Shidmov in, in Poland with Maciej Piechotka and he explained that these were the three masonry buildings and they created a triangle and these were the defensive points in the town and everything else was wood and uh, uh, these could control but from these three buildings, it was the Noble Palace, or maybe it was the Town Hall or Noble's Palace, it was the church and it was the synagogue, and uh, uh, they, they controlled the entire, uh, all the approaches into the town as a defensive network. I don't know that they were built at the same time, but the way he told the story, so this is oral history, it made it sound as if they were planned and, and erected as a, as a single composition. So in my memory, Probably not correct. I, I see them as simultaneous, without it's research. It's interesting whether, uh, whether, Ans, whether, Ans, whether there is any connection between Ansky's story and the real story of three. Well, Agnon's story is three part titles. Mm -hmm. The synagogues are some are earlier there on the margin of his story. But it, it is present in him. For, for, for me, it was very interesting to know uh, whether Ansky could read uh, Agnon's story. Because Ansky was involved during 1915, and the, the story by Agnon was published in Vogue. So I, I reread the, the anime, his pleasure to find for him by Ansky. What he does in the book, he doesn't mention he went, he went to the library. <laughs> he doesn't mention people who could, who could connect him to, to, uh, to the board because Agnon was, uh, was vice editor of this Mahed. But the editor Barter left the board before the war. So there, there was no, no, I don't know any personal connection between, between uh, Ansky and, and some involved sources. But, but the building stands, and we probably we are going to put a plaque that Gnon worked in this building in Vogue in 1907 before he made his Aliyah in 1908. <laughs> <laughs>